It's all throughout my history Faithfulness is born beside me Wind storm away to the spring In every season And from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my Promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Feel me calm, feel me. You are my strength, and you always will. I see, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. Yeah. I see your promises in fulfillment all over. of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, I see the evidence of your goodness Come on, church. all over my Anything else? I let the first service know this. Uh, I know demand is high right now. I have a uh, uh, American flag tank top, and, and I'd let it go. I, first service, I offered it for a thousand dollars, but I'm gonna have to bump that up because demand's getting a little higher with the you know lunch times coming real soon. 
Uh, but anyways, I am, uh, my name is Journey. I'm one of the pastors here at Encounter, and it is so good to be with you this morning, so good to be able to worship with you. Uh, if you are a guest with us this morning, welcome, uh, and, and I want to invite you to check out our Welcome Center following the service. You can do that by uh, walking straight out these double doors and going to the right. There will be a friendly face there to greet you, uh, even give you a, a little gift just to say thanks for being with us this morning. Unfortunately, it is not an American flag tank top. Um, <laughs> We also at that Welcome Center, we will find, uh, you'll find a Connect card. And that Connect card is your opportunity to share your information with us uh, so that we can connect with you, so we can get you plugged in to all the things that are going on in the life of the church. Um, as well, you can also find that Connect card digitally through our Encounter Church app. Um, and if you don't have that app, please, please, please download that app. It will keep you uh, up to date on everything that's going on around the church. And uh, believe me, things are starting to happen. Lots of things are starting to happen. So make sure you download that if you haven't already. And, and finally, our offering drop boxes are located through the double doors. If you came prepared to give this morning, thank you so much for your generosity. Um, we could not do what we do here at Encounter Church if it were not for uh, your generosity. So thank you. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, as we continue in our worship this morning. Father God, thank you so much for inviting us in to uh, be a part of what you're doing here on this earth, um, here specifically in Palmyra, Pennsylvania. Father, may we recognize the gifts that you have given us individually and how those gifts connect with uh, others in this body collectively to, um, to serve this community, to serve Palmyra, Pennsylvania, God, to... Um, to share the good news of your son Jesus with uh, those in our community. And Father, may uh, Ted's words this morning be honoring and glorifying to you. May those words be your words, uh, not his. And Father, may our worship bless you. May our worship uh, be honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Above all others, 
Jesus Christ, the King above all. to the Lamb, honor and glory, come on church, worthy is He who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power, He is alive, the storm is rolled away from all our worship. And all our worship will belong to Him forever. Death is conquered, and our Savior holds the keys. There is a name that reigns above all others. It's Jesus Christ, the King above all. guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. With your rod and your staff that give me courage, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. 
You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the caterer, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth, and it will not return to me empty, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy for you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up, and instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up, and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. Please just uh, join me in, in one more uh, word of prayer as we, as we jump in this morning. Father God, our prayer this morning is that you would be glorified. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's so good to see all y'all here this morning. My name is Ted. I am one of the pastors here on staff at Encounter Church. And if you are here for the first time, or perhaps you have missed some of the last weeks, I just want to give you a real brief recap of what we've been doing, what we've been working through. We have been working through uh, the book Unique uh, by Will Mancini. And essentially the whole point of this book is for us to discover God's unique calling on our lives, which uh, frankly is a wonderful thing for all of us to just constantly keep in front of us uh, because it's good to know if we are truly living out God's purposes for our lives or if we've drifted or have we allowed God's standards of, of success to be our guiding principles or have we allowed the kingdom of the world standards to infiltrate into our lives. And if you have missed any of the past couple weeks, I encourage you, go back and watch them. Go back and listen to them. You can find them on our website. You can find them on our app just because this has been a really, really good series. So this morning, we're going to continue in this series, uh, but specifically, we're going to explore the understanding that in our pursuit of God's unique calling, we may not always understand what God is doing. But here's the thing, even when what he is asking us to do doesn't make sense necessarily, God has called all of us to be faithful in spite of that. Or said it another way, how do we learn to let go of our own desires and what makes us feel secure and what makes us feel safe and instead trust that God's plan for our life is the best plan? Because if we're honest with ourselves, doing this is extremely challenging, but it's critical for us in understanding what God's unique calling is on our lives. A few years back, I heard a story, uh, and the story is about a man named Jack. Uh, and Jack was out hiking one day, and he was hiking alongside of a cliff when he accidentally got too close to the side and actually fell. Fell over the cliff, but fortunately for Jack, uh, there was a tree that was growing out right where he fell, and he was able to grab on to a tree branch, which momentarily stopped his fall. However, to his horror, he looked below him and saw it was a thousand-foot plunge down to the bottom. And he realized that the cliff face was too sheer for him to be able to climb back up to safety. And so in desperation, he did the only thing that he had left to do, which was just to cry out and pray that someone would hear him. Someone that was walking by and someone that could lower him a rope or a tree branch or something to be able to pull him back up to safety. And he was just hanging there and he was just calling out, help, help, is anybody up there? 
And there was no response. And for a long time, he just hung there and he realized he wasn't going to be able to keep doing this forever. So finally, he heard this voice call out, Jack, Jack, are you okay? Yes, yes, I'm okay, but I can't hang on forever. But who, who are you? Where are you? And the voice responded back, Jack, I'm the Lord. I'm God. I'm everywhere. He said, the Lord, you, you, you're telling me you're God. Yes, Jack, I'm God. Well, God, please help me. Okay, Jack, I will. But I need you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. Okay, God, I'll do whatever. Please just help me. Okay, Jack. Let go of the branch. <laughs> what? You heard me. Just let go of the branch. Trust me. Just let go. There's just silence. There was silence for a while until eventually Jack called out again. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> now, clearly, this is a fictitious story that never actually happened. But I think that the point of this just dives straight to the heart of the matter of what we are talking about today. We may not always understand why God is telling us to do something, but will we trust him when he does speak? Are we willing to do the thing that God is calling us to do? Now, if you're anything like me, when this question is posed, I immediately want to know what this means practically. What does it mean for us to follow God's plan on our lives when it doesn't make sense? Are there any stories that we can look at? Are there any examples that we can look for themes that would show up in our lives? Because the reality is all of us in here this morning and all of us uh, who are watching online, we're all unique. We all have different skills. We all have different abilities. We have all different skill sets that God has given us. But what qualities show up repeatedly in those who are living out God's plan for their lives? And that is a great question, and those are just great thoughts, and we're going to dive into that for the rest of our morning this morning. And how we're going to do this is we're going to go over just a couple examples from Scripture. And this list is by no extent comprehensive. There are probably 50 stories that I could have picked from. These are the ones that I just thought exemplified this topic very clearly, but also from different angles. And so we're going to go through a couple of those here, so let's do that. Now, the first one that we're going to look at if you have spent any time in church, and, and perhaps even if you have not spent time in church, chances are you know something about this story. It is arguably the best known Bible story that there is. And it comes from Genesis chapter 6 with a man named Noah. Now, we don't know this for sure because the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us, but chances are that, Mo, that Noah lived in an area called Mesopotamia. And at least today, Mesopotamia is a lot of desert, and it's not particularly close to the ocean or any large bodies of water. And so you can only imagine the confusion that would have been mounting in Noah's mind when God said to him, Noah, I want you to build a boat because a flood is coming. Now, I can only imagine how much ridicule Noah would have had to endure from his neighbors when they found out what he was doing. But Noah did as God asked, and because of that, he and his entire family was spared from the flood when the flood came. And then as Genesis 9.19 tells us, from Noah's sons and their wives, they fathered all the people who now populate the earth. Next story comes from the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 6. We encountered a man named Joshua. And uh, Joshua has just been given the reins to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. You might know Moses was the leader of the Israelites for 40-some years. Moses has now died, and Joshua has assumed the leadership mantle. And as one of Joshua's first orders of business, God says, Joshua, I want you to go and take the city of Jericho. But I don't want you to go attack it how you normally would, and I don't want you to lay siege to it how you might expect. Rather, I want you to do something a little bit different. I want you and all the people of Israel to go and I want you to walk around the city one time every day for six days. But then on the seventh day, I want you and all the people to go and I want you to walk around the city seven times while the priests are blowing their horns. And then at the completion of the final seventh circuit, I want you all to yell. And if you do that, the city will be yours. 
Now, I would hate to be Joshua in that situation. We have to understand, Joshua just assumed control. He is the new leader of the Israelite people. He's the new guy. They're used to Moses. They're used to God using Moses to do things like this, but they may be a little unsure about Joshua. I mean, he might even be unsure of himself. I, I would have loved to have sat in that war council meeting when he had gone to his commanders and been like, guys, listen, this is, this is the battle plan to take Jericho. Like, I, I mean, I just, I think it would have been a fascinating meeting to have been a part of. Yet, Joshua did exactly as the Lord commanded, and the city fell just as God said it would. Let's move forward to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 6 and 7, we encounter a man named Gideon. Gideon was frankly terrified, and he was extremely unsure of himself. But after some convincing, God got Gideon to agree to raise up an army to overthrow the Midianite oppressors that were oppressing the Israelite people. And so God said, Gideon, go in and gather an army. And so he does. He goes and gathers an army of 32,000 men. And when he does this, God comes to him and says, no, that army's too large. You need to decrease it. And so he does. 10,000 men go off. And he says, no, no, it's still too large. All the way down to 300 men. That's what's left. And that's what God says, yes, that's the number I want you to go take with you to overthrow the Midianite army. Now, we have to understand something here. This army that they were going up against was massive. Let me give you an example. In Judges 7, we discover that the army that the Israelites were going to face were comprised of the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the people of the East. In fact, Scripture tells us they were so numerous that they were like locusts in abundance. And even their camels were too numerous to count. This was a massive army. God told Gideon to take his 300 men, and that's what you would be used to overthrow this army. Now, for all of his flaws and shortcomings, Gideon must have been a world-class motivational speaker because I have no idea what he would have said to these men to get them to agree to go with him. Yet, he did as God asked, and the Midianite army fell just as God promised, and the Israelite people were freed from their oppression just as God said it would happen. One last story here. In this, in this series, we have been looking through the book of Jeremiah, and this, and this book of Jeremiah is just such a wonderful, wonderful book. But it is fascinating to look at the story of Jeremiah, because a simple evaluation of Jeremiah's life would have branded him an abysmal failure in our human understanding. For 40 years, Jeremiah spent all of his time and all of his energy preaching about Israel's need to turn back to God and to abandon their sinful ways. And after 40 years, he never succeeded in convincing the people that he was God's prophet or that they needed to turn back to God or that they needed to change from their sinful ways. In fact, for all of his efforts, he was threatened, he was ridiculed, he was physically abused, Jerusalem was finally destroyed, Judah was eventually ceased to exist as a nation, all because the people refused to accept Jeremiah's words. In our minds, Jeremiah was an abysmal failure. But, there's always a but. Here's the thing. God did not call Jeremiah to force an outcome. Rather, he called Jeremiah to proclaim his message. And we know that because in Jeremiah 1, verses 5, 7, and 9, this is what scripture tells us. It says, Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Therefore, you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And then the Lord reached out and he touched my mouth and said, look, I have put my words in your mouth. So even though by all of our human understanding, Jeremiah was a complete failure, he in fact succeeded in being faithful 
to God. And this part is extremely interesting to me. If you look at all of the powerful world powers, the kings, the nations, all of those names have essentially now been forgotten. And their influence is essentially null today. But Jeremiah, his influence and his words remain significant because he did as God asked and was faithful to him. And I could, keep, I could keep giving examples. We could talk in the New Testament. We could talk about Saul, who completely turned his life around when he became Paul. Or we could talk about the disciples, who totally gave up their lives to follow Jesus. Or we could talk about Jesus, the ultimate example, who rather than raising up an army and crushing the oppressors and putting everyone in their proper place, as was expected of the Messiah to do, he did the exact opposite. And he served those around him and he humbled himself and he chose to die a criminal's death on a cross. But by following and obeying his father in all of this, Jesus gave all of us the greatest gift ever, which is to be called children of God. You see, in all of these stories, there are themes that tie them together, and there's multiple of them, but I want to focus on one specifically this morning, one point that is made exceptionally clear, and that is this. God does not think like we do. God does not think like we do. In fact, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says it like this. It says, for my ways, or my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, the reality is, is when we are truly seeking out God's will for our lives, he will call us to put our human fears and understandings aside and instead replace them with faith in him, that he is God, that he knows what he's doing, that he will do everything that he has promised, and that, and this is so important, that he is leading us with the eternal kingdom of God in mind. And he's not leading us with the temporary kingdom of the world that we so often see. And the thing about these stories that truly just blows my mind is that in in all of these stories, all the people did not understand why they were doing what they were doing. It wasn't until later and sometimes much later that they were able to say, ah, (laughs) I get it now. God, I see what you were doing. In fact, in Jeremiah's situation, he possibly never understood why God had called him to do what he had to do, at least not on this side of eternity. And that's a reality for us. Whether we like it or not, it's just a truth that we may never know the full impact that we have on the kingdom of God by following his calling on our lives. And that's very significant for us to remember as we are pursuing God's call on our lives. We are simply called to be faithful and to trust that God knows what he's doing. I want to tell you one more story here this morning, and this is a personal story from more modern time. Uh, In 2013, my wife Heather and I, uh, we moved to Arlington, Virginia, just a couple miles outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, neither of us were very familiar with the area, and when you move to a new area, you try to find a church, and that's what we were doing. And we didn't really know many, and we heard about this church called McLean Bible Church. Maybe some of you have heard about it before. Um, We didn't really know much about it, like I said, but we decided that we would go check it out, and we discovered that this is an absolutely massive church. I'm talking they have about 15,000 attenders every weekend throughout numerous campuses in Northern Virginia. And this church is led by a pastor named Lon Solomon. And Lon has had an impact on my life that uh, you just talk about you know, what I was talking about earlier today that he will probably never, ever know. Not in, not in my relationship of coming to Christ, but just in my decision to pursue ministry and just all of those things, just in a very powerful way. But while we were in McLean, that wasn't the point of my story, while we were in McLean, they, uh, we had the opportunity to hear Lon give his testimony of how he came to faith. And it was such 
a touching testimony that I, I want to share just a, a, a very abbreviated version with you here this morning uh, because it just ties in so well to what we're talking about right now. So as Lon describes it, he had a very normal childhood. He grew up in a very uh, normal but conservative Jewish family. And, and as he describes it, as he was getting closer to the end of high school, uh, that's when things started to change for him. He, he really started getting into partying, and he really started getting into girls, and he really started getting into drinking. And then uh, he graduated from high school, and he decided that he was going to go to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And this is the late 1960s and the early 1970s. And you can only imagine in the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill what that was like in the 1960s and 70s. And Lon was all about that. And he plugged right into a fraternity, and he really got in and started partying. And that was like, that's just what he did. And then he started getting into drugs and then he started getting into pushing drugs. And, and things just got worse and worse and worse for Lon. And he didn't know what he was ser searching for, but he knew he didn't have it. And he just, he, he didn't know what to do. And eventually he got to the point where he started contemplating suicide. I mean, he, not even beyond that, he started actively planning suicide. One day, he was walking down the street in Chapel Hill when he was... Uh, or I should say in the spring of 1971, he was walking down a street in Chapel Hill when he was forced into an unwanted encounter with, as Lon describes it, the weirdest man in the world. And this man was a man named Bob Eckhart. Uh, and Bob was a street evangelist who would hand out Bible tracts on this street every Saturday in the spring of 1971. And he would blare old hymns over two megaphones that he attached to the top of his white van that he had plastered with Bible verses. The weirdest man in the world, as Lon describes him. However, Lon went on to describe how the people of Chapel Hill treated Bob. And they would walk past him and they would take his tracks and then they'd throw them at him. And then they would just make fun of him. And they would spit on Bob. They just treated this man like garbage. But the long story short is, Bob faithfully showed up on that same street every Saturday to do what he felt that God had called him to do. And eventually, Bob leads Lon to Christ. However, at the end of the story, Lon says something that just will always stick with me. He said this. He said, in all of my time of interactions with Bob, and, and Bob, and, and all of his time spent, and all of his energy, and all the mistreatment, and all the confusion, and all the frustration, and all of the spit that Bob endured, the only person that we know, there could have been others, but the only person that we know that Bob reached for Christ was Lon. One person. So I have a question. Did Bob fail? Was Bob outside of God's plan for his life? He only reached one person. Couldn't have his time and his energy be spent better elsewhere with a crowd that was more receptive to his message? I mean, clearly he was passionate about what he was doing. Couldn't have God used him in an environment where he could have reached many people, maybe hundreds of people for the gospel? Why would have he dealt with all of this mistreatment and all of this confusion and all of this spit to only reach one person, did Bob fail? And the answer is, and this is what Lon says, and I completely agree with him as well, that the answer is a resounding no. Bob did not fail. He truly felt that God had asked him to go to that street every Saturday in 1971, in the spring of 1971, so that he could reach Lon, who was actively planning suicide, but has now gone on to reach literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world for Christ, including myself, not for Christ, but just in, like I said, my, my journey. Guys, listen, and this, is, this is so important. And if you have tuned out the last couple of minutes, I want you to zone back in for this and I want you to hear this. God is always effective. God is always effective, but he's not always efficient. God is always effective, but he's not always efficient, at least not in how we define efficiency, because his ways are not 
our ways. He functions with the eternal kingdom of God in mind. He asks us to trust him, even if what he's telling us to do doesn't necessarily make sense to us. He is always effective, but not always efficient. Pastor Terry two weeks ago said this. He said, God's plan for our lives is rarely a straight shot to a visible goal. Rather, his plan's more akin to a a winding journey. And whether we like it or not, again, this is, this is the truth. God, God's plan for our lives is rarely revealed to us any other way than one step at a time. And frankly, his journey for us may look different at different stages of our lives. For example, a young woman, she might feel that God has called her to go to college. And so she enrolls and she heads off and the first two years of her time in college are spent gaining insights into things that she never would have and growing in her relationship with Christ. But at the end of their second year, she gets sick and she has to drop out. And then she has to spend the next two years in a rehab facility. Does that mean that she's out of God's plan now? Well, in that facility, she meets a young man and that man later becomes her husband. And they both love the Lord and they desire to serve him and they believe that his plan for them is to enter into the mission field. And so they begin training and they begin preparation, but halfway through the training, she learns that she's pregnant with a high-risk pregnancy with a special needs child. And because of this, they have to drop out of their preparation and they can no longer continue their mission's pathway. Does that mean that they've missed God's plan? Has the Lord abandoned them? Well, they discover that due to their experiences and caring for a child with special needs, now they're able to minister to other families who have similar needs. Their mission field now looks much different from the one that they had originally envisioned, but they discover that they had been in God's plan the whole time. Guys, that is the same for us. If we are always squarely in the center of God's will and we are listening to the direction that he is leading us on every step of the way, we will never be out of God's plan for our lives. And sometimes it is confusing and it is frustrating and it is discouraging and it is heartbreaking and undesirable and other times it is miraculous and it is joyful and it is a wonder beyond what we could have imagined. But if we're listening, we'll always be squarely in the center of God's will for our lives. And that's one of the most comforting realizations that I have come to in my life. God does not require me to figure out what my journey is going to look like. Rather, he reveals it to me one step of the way. And I know this because I have tried saying, hey, God, here's my plan for my life. And if you could just bless that, that would be wonderful. You know, <laughs> amen. Uh, and it hasn't worked out well. Let's just be honest. But when he reveals it to us one step at a time, it's up to us whether or not we will say yes to that next step. God doesn't force it on us. He gives us the option. He leaves it up to us. And then it's up to us whether or not we'll be faithful to him or not. And that's my challenge to y'all this morning as we're heading into the rest of today and into the rest of our week. I I pray that we would go home and we would think about this, that we would really, really process over this. But here is, here is my, uh, my challenge. And really it's a twofold challenge. And the first is this, the first is, will you actively seek out God's plan for your life? And you might be sitting there and you might be thinking, yes, Pastor Ted, I want to do this, but how? How do I practically even start? Where do I even go? And fortunately, I have a fairly quick but uh, correct answer to that question. And here it is. If you don't know where to start, start this way. Get into God's word, into scripture and read it. Read his word and reflect on his promises. Notice the similarities between the stories that he has presented us with. Notice the themes. Notice how God thinks, how God works. And then earnestly spend time praying and learning the sound of his voice so that when he talks to you, not if, but when, you know it's him speaking. 
There's a thousand voices right now that are all vying for our attention and they're all trying to get us to go in one direction or the other. And more often than not in my time in ministry, the question is, how do I know if it's God or if this is just me or even if it's something worse than that? Guys, the reality is God will speak to you. He will speak to you in a way that is different from how he speaks to me. He will speak to you in the way that you can hear him, but you must learn what his voice sounds like. It sounds like a simple step, but it's critical. Don't skip this. Read his word. Learn the themes. Earnestly pray and listen to what God is saying. And then the second part is this. When God speaks, will you be willing to take that next step of faith in your journey with him? You know, whether it makes sense or not, like Noah and like Gideon and like Jeremiah and like Bob Eckhart and Joshua, will you do as the Lord asks? And as we're working through all of this, just remember that we may not be able to see the impact that we're having on people. And that's okay because God knows. If he's asking you to do something, there's a reason. He has a kingdom of God mentality in mind and not the world mentality that we are so often just blinded by. We may never know the impact that we have on this side of eternity, which is, I think, one of the reasons that heaven is going to be so amazing. Because someday we will know. But God sees and he understands. And just remember, God is always effective, even when he doesn't appear to be efficient to us. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would be in this challenge. Father, you call us the body of Christ all with different tasks, skills, abilities, being asked to carry them out to the best of our ability. Father, I, God, I, I pray that you would just be glorified in all of this. Father, that you would speak to each and every person in this room who is earnestly desiring to hear your voice, that you would give them the courage to say yes to that next step. Father, God, we love you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Stay with me, church. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. And it's all creation grown and come on. It is. There's a new creation coming. the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Oh. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone Does the Father truly 
love us. Come on, God. He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And is Jesus our Messiah? Oh, forever those He loves. something fun to do this summer with your family? Well, look no further because we are going to be doing something fun on July 23rd through the 25th. It's our Encounter Church Family Camping Weekend at Gifford State Pinchot Park. There will be opportunities for you to go hiking, biking, canoeing, kayaking, swimming. If you're interested in signing up for this event, please stop by the table in the lobby. And if you do sign up, payment is due by Sunday, July 18th. We have some exciting news for you. On Sunday, August 29th, we are gonna be having our outdoor baptism service. If you are interested in being baptized or wanna know more about what baptism actually means, then contact the church office and someone will be in contact with you. Just to let you know, the church office will be closed tomorrow due to the holiday. Have a wonderful day and happy 4th of July. I know I, for one, can relate to that winding journey that Pastor Ted spoke about. It wasn't a, a point A to point B kind of journey. And, and I want to remind you of the challenges that, that Pastor Ted issued us to, to actively seek out God's plan for our lives, to actively look for what it is that God is calling us to. And then the next challenge is to take the next step in that journey. It's not always uh, a, a straight line to the destination. 
I know I never in a million years would have imagined that I'd be standing before you on a stage as a pastor, and never in a million years did I imagine I was going to travel uh, back from the beach to back to Pennsylvania with the cows. But here I am. And God has blessed it, and, I, and I'm so, so thankful for it. But will you actively seek him and take that next step? That is the challenge. As you leave this morning, I want to remind you that our offering drop boxes are located through those double doors. Thank you so, so much for uh, giving. For those of you that came prepared to give, we cannot do what we do here at Encounter Church without you. And as always, to my left is our prayer banner. Uh, if you are in need of prayer this morning, if you would like someone to pray for you and with you, please stop by that prayer banner. Have a happy fourth. Love you guys. I see the evidence of your goodness. All